I want you to be turning to Psalm number 56. Psalm number 56. And it's a, a psalm of a man who is looking at his life and realizing that he's in a lot of trouble. And he's in a lot of trouble with human beings. And so it begins, be gracious, O God, for man has trampled upon me. Yeah. And then he goes on to describe that. But then he says in verse 8, Thou hast taken account of my wanderings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not already in your book? Okay, I could spend about three weeks talking about the whole psalm, but I'm not going to. That's the verse that I really want to talk about. It's one of the early Psalms of David. I would place that to be written when he was in his mid-twenties, if you could imagine. Um, he's still very much looking like a country hick. He's a shepherd boy, and yet he's been thrust into the limelight, and here he is, and he's finding himself being pursued relentlessly by people, beginning with his own father-in-law, who is the king. After the Goliath incident, you remember Goliath? Um, and uh, that was when he was around 14, 15 years old. And after that, he marries the princess. And so Saul, the king, is his father-in-law, only now the king, his father-in-law, is so jealous of the popularity of David that he makes it his now complete uh, destiny to kill David. And he begins with his, <laughs> his SWAT team to go after David to kill him. And so that begins what happens throughout the middle chapters of First Samuel. The, the story of David, it's endless wanderings. And that's what this psalm is about. He says, all I've done is wander from, from his late teens now to his mid-twenties or nearly 30. He said, it's endless wanderings. I, I'm always on the move, trying to escape death. And so many times, death is right behind me by minutes, and I only just escape. And you can read that in Samuel. And he said, the men that have betrayed me, he would go into villages and they would welcome him and then send a message to Saul to say, we got him. And he would just escape by the skin of his teeth. Um, days and weeks that go into months, it just appears to be so meaningless. I mean, what's the point? I go to bed to get up to run for my life, find another cave sleep there and run for my life. He said, that's all it's been, futile, futile, going aimless, round and round in circles in the wilderness of Judea. And all I do is flee from one hiding place to the next. In fact, my destination in life is to find the next place of safety. And that came to a head. And whether this psalm was written after the kind of finale or before it, um, it doesn't make any difference, it's all in the same time, that it happened at a place called Ziklag, you might have read it, 1 Samuel 30, where he comes, and by this time he's had a bunch of guys join him, and he comes upon where they had left their wives, their children, and it's burned to the ground, and they've all been taken captive, and it says, and it's a very potent verse, it says that David, he cried, he wept, until he could weep no more. That's quite a statement. He said, I, I, that's it, man, that's it. It's the last straw. And he said he just wept until he could weep no more. And, and so you could say they were wanderings that were um, filled with tears of frustration, um, tears of anger, and also despair. Because it all began, really, because Samuel the prophet 
had anointed David when he was no more than 13 or 14 years old. He'd anointed David to become the next king of Israel. And you could say that he's in this situation saying, does anybody else get the message? You know, does anybody understand what God is doing in my life? And nobody did. And, and so he is pursued as he was and in such despair as he was and weeping until he could weep no more. Um, and then this, this psalm is the Holy Spirit's inspired answer to that. And it's where David came to realize the, the, the wonder of the, the, the fact that the Lord was actually as intimately with him as his tears. You know, it's one thing to say, God is with me. He's saying, God is with me when I'm crying my heart out, when, when I am exhausted and don't know what to do and what's the meaning of life. He said, at that point, you are so close to me. You are so real to me that he says, you, you catch my tears. You, you catch my tears. Now, I mean, that, that phrase alone, if I just said nothing else, the fact that God is so intimate, he is so close that, that he is he's actually catching our tears. Uh, and that is the heart of what is, is getting a hold of David here. Now, let, let's have a good look at it. And, and I want to give this text, but from the literal version. I might have mentioned this before, but um, you should get it on, on free on the web. Go to Google and put Young's Literal Translation, and you can put in a chapter and you just get that chapter. It's, it's all over the web. Um, it was translated in 1850, so the language is a bit uh, not 2020, but um, it is an excellent literal. That is, this is exactly what the Hebrew said, which is not as our translators sometimes make it. They make it so we can understand it better. Well, that's not always true because their ideas of understanding it better can sometimes miss the real meaning. And so the Young's literal says, My wanderings thou or you have counted. That is, every step I took, he says, you were counting the steps. You counted. Then he says, you, well, the, the actual, he says, thou. We don't use thou in English anymore, which is very sad. It's not merely old English. It's intimate English. Um, you know, the uh, plural of thou is you. Um, Texan is y'all, you know, it's, uh, which, which it really is, it is you all, you, that's the plural. Well, the singular, when I look at you, in Old English, I would say thou, and, and it means thou is very intimate, thou is very, it's more than personal. You reserve thou for somebody that is very special. And, and so he, that's how David says, his relationship to God is a thou. God is not merely a you, he's thou. But we can't say that in English today, but that's what it says here. So he says then, thou. Uh, that gives me goosebumps because I'm feeling what it means. That he's looking at God and he's saying, I to you and me to you is so intimate, is so utterly personal. It's, it's, you're not dealing with the whole wide world. You're dealing with me, thou. And then as if to consider it in the original Hebrew language, he says it again, thou. Place thou my tears in thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? Did you notice what he did with that? Not only does he say thou twice, but he says place Thou, you, you, you place my tears in your bottle. That's not exactly what I read in our modern version, where it says, David said, put my tears in your bottle. 
as if David starts this. But he's saying to God, "Would you, you, you put my tears in your bottle?" But the original Hebrew is he's sitting back, his mouth is open. He says, "I can hardly believe it. You, you place my tears in your bottle." You, do you understand the difference there? He, he's not saying, "Will you do it?" Rather, he's he said, "Wow, you do it. You place my tears in your bottle." Okay, hold that in mind. It's not about tears. I, I might say that the men of the Bible are a lot quicker to cry than men in the West. Uh, I don't know of any general over an army who, because of some defeat in life, sits down and in front of all his soldiers weeps until he can't weep anymore. Uh, but of course, that's offset by the all his soldiers were weeping too. So um, and that sounds so weird to the Western man, but I, I find it very interesting that the men of the Bible, the men that God chose to speak through, the Hebrew people, found it very easy to show their emotions and very unashamedly and never felt awkward about it. As surely as on the flip side, they were the same way with joy, leaping in the air and dressing in bright yellow and red just to say, I'm happy today. Um, they were very expressive with their tears. What are tears? Say it too quickly. What are tears? It's weird. I mean, a whole bunch of water starts streaming down your face. What are tears? Um, do you realize that uh, when, we, when we cry or when we have any deep feeling, because to understand this in the West, we would have to include here ideas of deep grief and sorrow and what the New Testament would call groanings that cannot be uttered. It's when, when you, you, you feel that deep sorrow that in many respects here in the West, they don't come to tears. But that's what he's talking about. Um, those experiences of grief and of sorrow and of tears, because that's what it is talking about, the tears, are a result of the story that we tell ourselves. Uh, we live by storytelling. I mean, this happens so quickly you don't realize it. But we have a story, every one of, one of us. We've got a story of what happened to us in this relationship or what happened to us when that happened. We've got our story, and we're telling ourselves that story. And that story is so terrible, it makes us cry. And, and, and we cry out from the story that we're telling ourselves. And of course, that story may indeed be the truth. It may be exaggerated. It may not be the truth. It's how we perceived it. And we now tell the story to ourselves of how we perceived that happening. And it becomes the final truth inside of us. And in this case, it causes us to cry. Um, it may be about the past. It usually is something that happened. In the past, I mean, it might have happened yesterday, but we tell the story of what happened yesterday as we perceived it, as we felt it, and we cry today that how could that have happened? How could she have said that? How, after all, we had hoped, we had thought, um, or, or it could be um, of your deep past when you were a child, and that's, that's they're bad stories. Because as a child, we have no editing capacities. Whatever we see, whatever we hear, we don't edit. And so what a person says to us, as an adult, we might edit it out and say they were having a bad day. But a child can't do that. That is reposited in them as final truth. It, it's the, it is the essence of the pain of child abuse. That when a child is abused, especially sexually abused, that they have a story of themselves being dirty, of themselves causing it to happen. And they've got no way of editing that out. And the abuser many times enables that story. 
And so 40 years later, they still believe that's what happened because they bring that, it's their story. And they've been crying over the story all their life. That, but do you understand this story that I'm saying? It's, it, we've got to understand that. There's a story going on inside our heads and, and it causes us to cry. David wandering in the wilderness. The story in his head was, doesn't anybody understand what Samuel said? How could they not understand it? And after Goliath, how, I mean, you can sit down for a whole evening and have a story tell to yourself uh, of why isn't this? Why is that? How could this happen? Um, it's the story. And, and as I say, the stories are so terrible, we, we end up weeping over them. And of course, we also tell stories about tomorrow. They're ghastly stories. They're nightmares because they haven't happened. They probably won't. But in, in our crazy heads, we make up stories about tomorrow. And, and just very recently, um, I listened to a person give a detailed account of what will happen next year after COVID has destroyed most of the USA. Um, and, and they were on the verge of tears. It was so real to them, but of course it, nothing happened. But it's, you understand, these stories that we, it's, it's going on all the time. You, you tell each other stories about what happens here. You tell each other stories uh, about everything. It's going on, our heads are nonstop doing that, but so quickly. Um, and, and so I, I say again, our tears could be expressed as heart size. That, that, is a, that sigh that in many people comes out as tears, but for others it doesn't. It's just the sigh of the heart. It's almost a pain inside. Um, it's, um, as I said, it's groanings that cannot be uttered. But tears, I'm, I mean, I'm allowing the non-tear experience, but the Bible is speaking about tears. And tears are, are amazing. It's amazing because we cry because God in creating us gave us tear ducts. He, he built into our bodies a, an incredible mechanism by which we could cry. But it, it's, it's amazing because of what the tears are. If you could literally take each tear and analyze it, which has been done and done and done and done again. If you can do that, every tear, or shall I say set of tears, are different. So that the tears you cry for this will not have the same chemicals in them as when you cry over that. And, and so tears of joy, which are very real tears, they are very different in their chemistry than the tears of what David is doing, tears of frustration and anger and confusion, futility and all that goes with it, they're very different chemistry. Now, that, that I'm, I'm sort of running out of words here. When, when I try to think that those little drops of water going down my face are so unique that Every emotion that is going on inside of me is reflected in that tear with a specific chemistry so that you could pick up that tear and know how I'm feeling by what's in that tear. It's, it's amazing. I, I, sorry, I sort of run, run out of words at that point. That um, I mean, you're just not having a good cry. You are letting all your emotions run down your face, and, and they, each one is specifically in the tears. And, and David makes the big point of that. He says, my tears. It's not, it's not just tears in general. It's almost as if he knew what I said, though I doubt he did. But um, he says, my tears. That is the tears that uniquely are telling my story. That story has now been translated chemically into these little drops of water going down my face. It's my tears. They're my tears. And um, he looks at this in other parts of, especially the Psalms. Um, that th this is when I'm, I'm, I'm praying. My, my tears are talking to God. My, my tears are actually, you could say, it's liquid prayer. It, it is 
prayer that is now taken on the form of chemistry tears and they're being presented before God. So in Psalm 39, he says, Hear my prayer, give ear to my cry, do not be silent at my tears, as if my tears are talking to you. Well, they are. The, the tears each have their own message. Or in Second Kings 20, uh, the word came to the king and said, I have heard your prayer, I have seen your tears. That is... With the eye of God, I have read your tears. I, I can see what the tears were, were saying. And so, as I said, these tears were very specific. They were David's tears, not just anybody's tears. They, they carried the message of David's frustration and pain. Um, they were the wandering tears. They were tears made up with going from cave to cave to hide from an insane father-in-law uh, they were tears that described the envy and the betrayal of people their the hatred and the murder plots they, they expressed all the feelings of abandonment of loneliness meaningless pathways going around and around in circles my only uh, intention is to hide myself from a crazy murderer you could sum it up in the two words I talked about last week, which is grief and sorrow. Do you remember that? Grief and sorrow, they, they are the two most extreme words. They cover grief all the way from physical pain, through mental anguish, through emotional meltdown, through depression, darkness, despair of mind. And, and not only that which I originate, but which other persons have done that cause it. And so when I'm caught between the crossfire, um, the word is actually used in Scripture, when you're, you're wounded in crossfire, where you had nothing to do with it except be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And it says the word is grief, because it also includes sickness and wounding of the body. Well, all that summed up, in, in this, as, as David sits somewhere in a cave writing this psalm and saying, why, why? All the grief and the sorrow of the days that had passed. And, and let me emphasize, it was other humans who did that. And that's how he begins the psalm. Because we are very quick in Western Christianity to blame God for it. Um, we've got this terrible image of God uh, he's, he's a monster, and there's no other word for it. He gets a kick out of making pains for you. And if ever you're, you're I mean, never pray for the will of God. Dear Lord, he'll screw your life up. Um, that's the kind of God most Americans worship, which is a terrible thing, because he's, he's a nightmare. He's a gowl. He's not a God. And um, the Bible makes it very plain. God didn't do this. Saul did it. Saul the king, the, the betrayers in the villages did it. It wasn't, it wasn't God. And that's a, for, for, for here in the West, that's a massive step to realize that it isn't that, well, God's teaching you a lesson. Oh, give me a break. He can show you a verse in Scripture, not bash you over the head. You know, uh, what, what kind of a God do you worship? It, it's, no, this, this did not originate with God. It, it, the, that's the glory of this psalm, that it is his understanding of God, the kind of God he knows that that God intervenes and takes what man has done and does something with it. It's very different, very, very different. Um, men, men, human beings, wrote the script. They thought it was the script of life, and we're writing it. This is the way life is. And it was a script of hatred, murder. But this is the amazing thing, and I could go off of this, could be a rabbit trail, but very quickly, there's only one script, and that's God's script. He writes his script. But every human being gets on stage and thinks we're using their script. Yes, this is true. Every human being thinks that their script is what life is about. We wrote the play. And we get on stage to act in our play. But there's only one script, and he's the scriptwriter. So what 
But this is the miracle. He takes your script and he includes it into his. Do you remember he said to the, well, it was Joseph, uh, to his brothers, when they had sold him as a slave. You remember that in, the, in Genesis? A and he said to them at the end, you meant it for evil. God meant it for good. Did you hear what I said? You meant it. What? Well, it was your script. This is what we said we would do with our annoying little brother. So what did God do? He said he took your it. He took your script and meant it for good. Do you follow what I mean? That they had a script that was intentionally destroying Joseph. And God said, then, I'll use your script, and I'll take Joseph using your script, I'll take him into Egypt, but then I'll make him the prime minister to save the world. And, and um, so what you meant for evil, God took your script and meant it for good. That's the God that we're talking about here. Huh. The Holy Spirit never wastes a minute. doesn't matter if it was intended to hurt you, it will turn around and be part of his plan for good. That, that's how he works. Or to put it this way, the Holy Spirit never wastes a teardrop. There's never a tear that's rolled down your cheeks that is wasted. The Holy Spirit says, we'll use that and use it for good. But okay, he says, you put my tears or you place my tears in your bottle. Now, that's a fascinating thing. I'll be honest, that's what drew me to this text in the first place many years ago. Because that's a weird statement. Took my tears and placed them in your bottle. Um, well, I don't think we'll ever understand what it's about until we understand what bottle is. Uh, you do understand that was written 1000 B.C., so they didn't have sort of empty Coke bottles hanging around. Um, in fact, they didn't have bottles, really. Um, what did they have then? They used the skins of their lambs and goats, and, and they sewed them up, and they, they made them then bottles, but they were really skin. But the major one that they had, because you can drink water out of a stream, you don't need to carry that around if you live in 1000 BC. But what you did carry around was wine. And so the bottle there, that is just, I mean, totally west. They didn't, no, forget the bottle thing. What they had was a wineskin. He said, you put my tears in your wine skin, which would be the, actually, um, it could be the whole skin of a goat that was then stitched up and um, because a goat skin can expand when the wine ferments. Uh, but l listen how they made wine. They took the grapes and they put them in a large chamber rock chamber many times and like like a rock bath and out from the bottom there would be pipes that would lead down to troughs and so they filled the the bath or the chamber with, with the grapes and then they crushed them and that may be just with banging them with wood, but many times it was the villagers would get in the, there and stamp on the grapes until they were stamped into nothingness, and all the juice would go out through the pipes and be collected. And you could almost say then that the juice of the grapes were really the tears of the grapes. They were crushed, and out from their crushing came the juice. And the juice was collected and placed in these goat skins in order to ferment and be turned into something other than grape juice. Do you get the picture there? Gee, I, I, to me, it, it, it really makes sense. That's what David was talking about. 
because as I say we're not talking about simply putting your tears in a bottle that you label in the refrigerator it, it, there's something else going on here yeah he said take my tears you placed my tears in your wine making skin that that it means that the that they've stamped on me they've crushed me and my tears came out but you you caught them and, and you put them in in your wine skin uh, well okay let's take that a step further does god have a warehouse full of goat skins and one of them has your name on it you know this <laughs> no obviously not that 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 is not what he's talking about then what is the wine skin where tears are collected and turned into something other than went into the skin the only answer which covers the entire bible is the incarnation and it's interesting and i'm not going to push this too far but jesus was called the lamb of god and the wine skins were often made of the lamb the goat skin and um but the fact is and this the the incarnation has been left out of the gospel people call the gospel that jesus died for you and, and no stop that stop that the, the yes he did die for you but the whole question is who was the one dying it makes a big difference and the incarnation that is the beginning of the gospel and the incarnation is that god became one of us god became a human being and i can't say that stronger or punch my fist any harder god became a human being and you'll never understand the gospel till you know that otherwise jesus well he's a prophet he's a good man he said you know blah 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 no god became a human being without ever ceasing to be god and so god is being god inside human and human now has been elevated to be the one who reveals god um that makes all the difference in the world because if he became human god entered into everything that's human and, and to enter into everything that's human it means whatever he touches he heals he's going to make us right but it's going to make us right from the very guts of our being when, when i say that god became human i know because i've asked questions of people they really think more in terms that he sort of looked like it was a shell of a human he had the human mask on he but if he was god well inside that mask he was just god but he really looked he was like sort of a halloween god he, he was dressed up as a human but we all know that you know underneath he was really god but the entire meaning of salvation is that god became human which means he saw as we see he felt as we feel he he took to himself our emotions he took to himself the feelings of our five senses he really entered into being a human because otherwise he could never heal our feelings and he could never heal our emotions he could never heal any of our invisible us no he he did take our flesh and he looked a hundred percent like a galilean jew um talked like one too had the right accent i mean he became one of us but it wasn't just outward it was fully and the ancient fathers of the church said that whatever he didn't take to himself and assume was not healed that is if he didn't take your emotions if he doesn't know anything about your emotions then he never healed them you're on your own uh, unless he knew our sin and took our sin to himself then our sin is not taken away he had to take it he had to become that and in so doing carry it away and so it means do you hear me that god the creator joins our the creation he created 
and now he has tear ducts. God now is so one of us that he can cry and cry because he's telling himself the stories, only his stories are absolute truth, and that causes him the tears. And so we have what we quickly run over. You know, it says at the tomb of Lazarus that Jesus wept. And I feel like saying, stop. You said, what? <clears throat> Jesus wept? Yeah, he wept. But then when he looked over Jerusalem, the people who were going to crucify him, it says Jesus wept over Jerusalem. Only the Greek language there says with great um, sobs, with great heart sobs, he wept over Jerusalem. He has full, he, he has, I, I don't know how better to say it, he, 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 he took to him a body that was like ours in every fashion so that he had all the mechanism to cry and to produce tears. God knows how to cry. But also it means that he took our sorrows well he can he can that's why he became human so that as human he can take our screwed up human he can take us at our worst and he can assume that to himself take responsibility for it and so in in isaiah it says he bore our grief and carried our sorrows you never hear that these days. They say he died for your sin, and they leave it at that. Yes, he did die for our sin, but he also died for everything that sin did to us, which means grief and sorrow. He, he took to himself the gut-wrenching cries of our heart. He took to himself those feelings of frustration that we have no idea what's going on, and we can't handle this, and I'm at the end of my rope. He took that and made it his. That's what the cross is all about. He became us. When we look at the cross, we see ourselves there. And it means that when we say the word God, we're not thinking of a cold, feelingless, remote God. But the God who has stooped, if I could use that word, he has stooped down inside us. And there's never a feeling we've had. There's never an imagination that's told us a story. But that he, I know what you're talking about. I've got it. I've got it. I'm one with you. I've taken it. He takes our tears. He, he places them in his, in his bottle and he's the bottle. He's the bottle. Jesus is the bottle. It's placed in him. It's placed in him. He became it. And then what's the death of Jesus? He takes that to death. They, they can't, that part can't be healed. It's so badly screwed up, it can only be taken to death. And then resurrected a new person. A person now that is not merely beginning again, but beginning in a totally forward movement into a world that we've never known before, which is a world of truth and light and love and peace and joy that is divine by nature. That, that's the gospel. It's the gospel. He exchanged. He exchanged our sin for his righteousness, but he also exchanged our despair and darkness of heart for his light and his peace. So, so we have a message for those that are wallowing in the darkness of their emotions, who are crying tears that are filled with the chemistry of hopelessness. And we can say, yeah, Jesus took that. He made it his, and he turns it around this is his mo if you if you study the life he delights in it he joins us at our worst that's his thing see the thing of religion is i only want to know you at your best don't you come in here with a long face this this is a church good grief you can't deal with problems here um and that's their god as I say, it's not the God of the Bible, it's the God of religion. Cold, feelingless, remote. 
and and so we scream at him and we try to am I have I contacted yet and no the God of the Bible in the face of Jesus Christ is that God came absolutely inside of us there's a whole word in the Greek language that says it that he's inside of me feeling with me and I'm inside of him it's a great exchange is taking place and yet I never become him and he never becomes me. We, we are utterly one, yet never losing our own person. That, that's the gospel. He's my wineskin. And all the tears of my life were taken and placed into him so that in him I might become totally transformed to be something else. And then through the Holy Spirit, he gives it back to me. It's like he takes me to the wine cellar. He says, do you remember 2020? That was a good year. Look at this. Here's the wine. You know. It's, um, or to put it this way, God is not an outside observer. He's not walk. People say, well, he's with me. Yes, he is with you. But you better define the word with. <laughs> with in the Bible means face to face, as close as you can get, breathing in each other's face. It means you're one with. You are with Yes, he's with you, but, but many Christians think of Jesus as up ahead of us somewhere. We're following Jesus. And from way back here, we're saying, what would Jesus do? Good grief, that's enough to give you anxiety. I mean, I, I don't know what Jesus would do, but when he comes inside of us, he bees himself. He bees himself. So my question is, what is Jesus doing? Not, not what would he do. What is he doing inside of me? What, what's, what's, what's he doing? He's taking my tears and, and, and he's transforming them. And I think it's very interesting that it, it says in Ephesians 5, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit, as if he parallels the wine and the Spirit. I don't, as I said, I don't want to place these things too far, but it, it's, it's what this is saying to us. Place my tears in your wine-making bottle. As if he takes our tears and says, it's okay, I'll deal with this. I, I'll handle this. To you I give release. I, I release you from this. It, it won't cling to you anymore. I release you. Uh, to you I give the healing of your person and wholeness, but I, I'll handle your tears. He does it. And that, that's where this literal translation really underlines it. He places, he places my tears. Whereas our version tends to suggest we've got to do it. But he does it. And, and, and the verse is a sense of, thou. Do, do you hear what I, David is saying, thou. Thou, my, my intimate, my personal, thou. You placed my tears in your bottle. Well, I mean, can I think it? You did it. You did it. Which brings us to the whole thing of faith. Because the moment you've got to do it, well, I hope you've got enough faith. I, and of course, when you come back still in depression on Monday, uh, obviously you didn't have enough faith. Or maybe there's sin in your life. Who knows? You know, that's the message of religion, wherever you find it. It's all up to you. It's on your shoulders. I know Jesus died, but <laughs> good. I'm glad he died. I'm glad he rose again. But um, unless you've got the faith, then this is not going to work. And that's the message of religion. Whereas this is saying he did it, which means how did Jesus ever take upon himself the grief and the sorrow of mankind and come through that without collapsing under the burden. And it says he never took his eyes off the Father. His faith was continually in the Father that he would be strengthened to do this and carried through by the Holy Spirit. And it would be the Father who would put his arms around him and welcome him and us with him. It was Jesus' faith. I do not have the faith to be a Christian. Sorry about that. But I don't. I really don't. Um, and people who say they do are the ones who try and get saved every Wednesday and Sunday because they, they know by Monday it didn't work. It didn't work. 
And so I feel like, what's that other word religion has? Backsliding? You're forever sliding all over the place. Where That's because, okay, if you think you've got the faith to carry this through, no. Did, did the sheep have faith to come out of the wilderness and find the shepherd? See, you've got to find Jesus. You've got to accept Jesus. Sheep hadn't got the faith for that. It was the shepherd, Jesus, who came where the sheep was, the shepherd who believed he could carry the, the, the sheep home, and the shepherd who knew that at the end he would be back in the flock. It was the sheep just sat there, didn't, didn't do a thing. Um, that, that's it. it's, it's the whole thing of faith here. How, how do I do this? I rest in the wonder that he's done it. He's done it. No. He, he made the great choice. We say you, you've got to have a choice as, as a Christian. You've got to choose. Well, yeah. But let's, let's before you run with that, let, let's, you've got to choose. Yes, you do choose. But, uh, you know, make your decision for Christ. Yes, I'm not, I know. But get the big picture. What is the incarnation? The incarnation is God's choice for, to, to, to accept you. It was all about that. We see, we, we are so jolly self-centered. We, we, I made my decision for Christ. I'm, that's great. Ever thought about him making a decision for you? Or maybe we think that our decision is much more important than his. So that if our decision doesn't agree with his decision, well, sorry, God, my, my decision. No. Please understand this. You say, I accepted Jesus. You did. Uh, by the way, it was the Jesus who'd already accepted you. So I guess you accepted your acceptance. You chose your choice. You, you chose what he had chosen. Um, he has come, what I'm trying to say here, he came to you as you are a pool of tears and a veil of tears and a pathway of tears. And he says, I will take that because I will carry this to its proper end. And here is my peace and here is my joy. The great exchange, that's the gospel. And it's his faith. Well, then where does my faith come in? My faith is I rest in his faith. I, I, I trust, I trust in him. And he is the faith. It says he's the author and the finisher of our faith. And so I trust his faith. And do you know there's a, some wonderful thing that before long you are faithing with his faith. But it didn't start with you. <laughs> Uh, and, and it's a reversal. It's great. I've cl I, I, I used this text the last two weeks, but this is really maybe where it's really at. He said that Jesus said, "The Spirit of the Lord is upon me." He said, "I've got good news for the afflicted." He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Does that sound like someone crying? It says to proclaim. What is it? To com to comfort. All who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them uh, flowers in their hair instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a spirit of fainting. That, that's all here. That's what this is talking about. But did you see the key word there is instead, instead, instead? I'll take that. I'll give you this. That's what I so our tears have been in this wineskin of God with us, God in us. Our tears have been reconstituted to become the wine. And this is a biblical concept. It's the, it's the cup of his divine humanity. Um, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane cried tears. You ever thought about that in the Garden of Gethsemane? And it was when he was mentally accepting the pathway into our tears, he cried and he said, the burden. It was only when he kept his eyes on the Father, which only he could do. And he says, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, the cup of our tears, the cup of our brokenness. He's going to drink it.
It's going to become his. And he does it, but then he gives to us another cup. And that's what this communion that we do is all about. And it really is. If I go back to the early church, we have a cup of wine. And as we drink it, we are actually imbibing the divine nature. We're actually imbibing, not that the wine is that magic. I mean, we're recognizing this is what this cup is. And we... We look through the cup, we, we take through the cup, and we actually take the divine humanity. We're not taking God, we're taking the God who became one of us. And we, we are actually eating that God. He knew what he was doing when he gave us this to do, because we need the symbolism, we, we need the physicality. You can talk about a lot of things and it seems so ethereal. And he says, I'll give you a piece of bread. And when you take that bread, remember, really, you are eating me. I am becoming your very life. As surely as this bread will be put throughout your body, you'll have eaten it and digested it. He said, I have become one with you. And my blood is not merely blood shed 2,000 years ago. It is an ever-present. It's bringing to you all the fullness of this life. You drink it. It's one. Um, and then the I've, I've already quoted, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. That is, you, you who were in, in the tears, now be drunk, be drunk with, with, with another wine, the, the wine of the Holy Spirit, so that we are actually exhibiting, dare I say, a divine drunkenness, that we, we're now with the love of God and the joy of the Lord and the peace of God, with a life that cannot be defined on this earth. That's the way it is. And of course, he gives us a new story. Um, that, that's, we see life differently. I, I, it's hard to explain. But what could have been a life of tears, you look back now, and realize every step really led me here. That, yes, it, it did hurt. It, it was tears. But there has been an invisible hand that has brought me to where I am now. And it changes everything. Um, it seems that every step of my life has led me to the knowledge of Jesus that I have now. Though when I was walking those steps, I didn't realize that. There's a lot of steps I walked, wandering, futility, screaming, does anybody understand? Um, but that, as I say, looking back, he has, there's a, do you remember, like you lived then, um, ever heard, just put it that way, have you ever read of an alchemist? They were neat guys. <laughs> they, they, back in the Middle Ages, they, they thought there was a formula to turn lead into gold. And so they would spend their life with all these weird experiments trying to turn lead into gold. Uh, you might have noticed it didn't work. But um, Jesus is the real alchemist. Uh, he took you and turned you into his own image and his own likeness. Wow, that's neat, you know. Um, it's the way it is. Uh, and um, we, we have been taught, it, it's, um, it, it's part of... Um, well, it's religion. I hate to keep on using the word. But that's where we live. We live in a world of religion. So we're knocking up against it all the time. And religion doesn't go here. Religion and, as I say, you find religion all over the place, in unexpected places. But, but religion has the idea of a Christianity that is, I call it triumphalism. It's not triumphal, that we are triumphal. We are. In Christ I 
can do all things. Um, we are more than conquerors. We are, yes, it's triumphal. But a triumphalist is someone that has got to make that be in every second. That is, I cannot accept anything else. Life is triumph. So if you come in with a sad face, I will, I will, you can't. You're a Christian. You've got to put a smile on your face and praise the Lord. You know, that's triumphalism because I don't feel like doing that right now. And um, you're, you're giving me now a law. It's a legalism. You, you've got to look happy. Um, I look in some of these churches where I go to speak odd times, you know, especially the big ones. And uh, I go into the parking lot because nobody knows me till I get up on the platform. So I can go in the parking lot and just look, you know. Um, and and there, there's so many normal people there. <laughs> they're, they're shouting at their kids uh, and they, they look very unhappy. And, um, but you watch as they walk toward the church, they're putting on their church look. And by the time they reach the doors, praise the Lord, brother. You know, I say, jolly, why don't you be honest? As if God doesn't know what's behind that mask. Because <laughs> it's okay. See, we're not triumphalist. We are triumphant. But we don't have to put on a face to try and prove we are what we're not. Um, that, that produces a, that's phony. I, I don't like the word hypocrite, but it is hypocritical. It's phony. It's your Halloween costume that you put on every Sunday. It's a cheap substitute. Very cheap. It's a trinket. You bought it in Walmart. It's, it's not joy. It's a cheap imitation. The joy of the Lord can... The joy of the Lord can rise through your tears. It's the joy of the Lord is, is, doesn't need necessarily mean you're having a good day. Um, Legalism doesn't allow the tears to flow because you've got to be this strong person for Jesus. When I, before I came to live in San Antonio, I was here. I did meetings down in the theaters downtown, auditoriums. And in those days, there'd be about 2,000, 3,000 people in the meeting. And we would lay hands on everybody. Well, I that's how it ended up. We, we said, we lay hands on those who are needing that. And the whole audience decided they needed it. And, and so after I'd given a six-hour seminar, we would then have 2,000 people who want hands laid on them. That was the good old charismatic days. And um, it, it was, they'd all sit on the front row, stretched right across the front of the auditorium. And, and I would go down laying hands on each one. Some wonderful things happened. But if anybody looked as if they needed further help, then I had a team that would come after me and pray with them. And I came on this woman, and as the moment I touched her, she burst into sobbing, gut-wrenching tears. And so I signaled to you know one of the team, maybe this lady's going to need help. And I went on down, 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 down. And of course, as I went down, the people got up, left another lot, came and I went around. And I came back down. The woman was still sobbing as if, I mean, she'd just begun. It was, and she, I mean, it took me a good 15, 20 minutes to go up and down those rows. And that happened, I mean, back and forth, back and forth, and she never moved. It was just tears. She was, her, her dress was wet with her tears. And, and um, I, I looked for the people who would pray with her, and they just said, she doesn't want any help. Well, long after we'd all finished, she stopped crying. And we asked, you know, what was the matter? And she said when she was eight, and she looked around 40, 45 years old. And she said when I was eight years old, I was crying at my mother's funeral. And my grandmother slapped me and said, Christian girls don't cry. They just thank Jesus that, you know. And she said, I have never cried 
since I was eight years old. And she said, I just cried 40 years of tears. Wow. And that, that's legalism. Um, it would do that. You can't be real. You can't be real. Whereas this man who wrote this psalm is being so real that he could, as a, a man who is a leader of men, could say, I sat and I wept until I could weep no more, but then realize that this incredible God who loves me so intimately, so personally, that he actually took my tears and put them in his wineskin and, and gives me back. You, do you realize that this morning we have been drinking a wine that's 3,000 years old that was manufactured from David's tears? You ever thought about that? That this psalm was manufactured out of the wineskin of David's tears. And 2,000 years, no, 3,000 years later, the Holy Spirit pulls it out of the wine cellar and says, have a drink. This is good stuff. And, and I think if we began to look back over our life and realize that many of the times of the tears have been served back to us as the joy that we have today, that but for those times that have now been totally reversed and reconstituted by the Holy Spirit, uh, but he did. And we're now living somewhere we never thought we'd live. It's amazing. But the biggest thing is that while, because this is where this is at, while it was happening, okay, he's crying now. But in the middle of his tears, he realizes he's taking this. and put, That means it's not meaningless. It's not without purpose. That he takes it and says this is of such importance. I, I'm, I'm taking this. That this is such significance. Your every tear drop has got such significance to my love that I am taking it and, and personally being the place of its transformation. Uh, that can change your tears. That, that can give me strength in the middle of what otherwise would be hopeless. That's putting a stop, actually, because tears give birth to tears. And certainly stories give birth to sequels. <laughs> and the, but this, what David is saying, stops that. He's in the middle of his tears, and then he stops, and he says, but just a minute, just, just, just hold it, hold it. He said, yes, I wandered. I've been wandering for years, hopeless, nowhere, pathways. But you recorded every step. So it wasn't exactly futile, was it? it, it you, you said it was important enough that it, it should be recorded. And then he says the text, you... You, you, all these tears that I'm talking about here, you have taken them and put them into your wineskin. And, and then, then the whole psalm turns. He begins to then meditate on the greatness of God's love and what it means. And I believe that every one of us in, in some way, shape or form, um, we're here. There's no doubt. If, you, if you've never cried, maybe you need freedom from legalism. Um, crying is part of life. But we're not crying alone. We're, we're not crying futile tears. I mean, I, I don't know if you, you get it, but the very fact that he said that he took, placed our tears in his wine bottle gives them significance. Then it gives significance to the fact uh, of, of what was going on inside of you to cause the tears. It was not some hideaway thing that you're ashamed of and we don't want to talk about it. He said, this is so significant, I'm going to place it in my bottle. You, you understand, if it isn't significant, he would have thrown you a Kleenex and said, put it in the garbage. You know, no, he says, that is so significant. Give me that Kleenex. <laughs> that's going in my wine bottle, you know. Okay, well, that's what it meant to me. <laughs> uh, and, and it means 
it, it's not my faith. I don't have to say, I've got to have faith to get out of this. I lean back and realize you had the faith to carry me through. You had the faith to take these tears. And now I'm just going to say amen to that. These are your tears and, and you're going to reconstitute them. You're going to make it so. Um, it, it's, it's the God who stops. Um, he doesn't come in and say, now stop that. We've got work to do. You know, religion would say that. Uh, I mean, I was raised in England with stop crying, be a man. And that was, I don't know what they said to girls, but uh, the idea of a man, the idea of David crying, was, that's not British. <laughs> so, um, where instead, it's a, the God of the Bible comes in and sits with us. He sits with us so close that he can catch our tears. That's pretty close. And we, we feel we've got to, I ought to be doing something. I ought to move on, you know, get out of here. And he says, yes, we will. But first of all, let's, let's capture your tears. They're so important. And then we'll just sit here until you have strength to go on. It's, it's not the God I was raised with, you know. The God who wants to know my stories. He wants to know what made us cry. And I know we talked about it last week, but the Emmaus Road, it's amazing. He comes to those guys disguised. So they, they will feel no need to be hypocrites. If they knew it was Jesus, they wouldn't tell him how they're feeling. <clears throat> so he comes disguised. And essentially he says, why are you crying? They weren't crying, but they, they had been, and they probably would be. And he said, what is the matter? You know, so I don't know what that does to you, but I, I'm speechless. God not only became a man, but then disguised himself so we wouldn't be put off. And he says, what things? And they begin, you know, the, that's, this is the story. They tell him the story. We had hoped. We thought this is the way it was going to be. He said this, he said this, he said this, and he, I thought we, we thought this, and we thought that, and we thought that. And then it's all fallen apart, and we've got nowhere to go. And this is what's going to happen when we get home, and it's all a mess. He said, you finished? <laughs> and he says, and, but, and it doesn't come over in our Bibles like it, but it's, the tone is of, of love. He says, you, you're so sick-headed sometimes, aren't you? He said, um, slow of heart. But let me tell you what. And immediately he can speak into it. And those tears, by the time they get to their house, the tears have totally gone. And it's balls of fire that are coming out of their eyes. Now our heart is burning within us. They run back seven miles to Jerusalem to tell the guys. But that's what he does to all of us, all the time. We say so glibly, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Well, just think about what you just said. It means he sits down beside us and says, we're not leaving here until we got this straight. You don't have to go and be a mighty woman of God. Just let's hang out here until you get the strength to go on. It's the way it is. Well, there's probably a lot more, but that's about it. Um, recognize where your tears have been put by the love of God and in the strength of the faith of Jesus. As he carried them through the cross. It's done. It's finished. And when I rest into that, then the Holy Spirit witnesses that to me and I find the strength that I need. So now the blessing of God, who is almighty love, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that blessing rest upon each one of us, opening our innermost eyes to see and to know that every tear, every grief, every sorrow, and all the mess that goes with it was placed inside of Jesus, carried into death that we in his resurrection might walk in his life and in his love 
peace. Open our eyes. Let this day be the beginning of days for a multitude of people. So I bless you. And that is the way it is. Amen.